In the 1300s, we experienced the Great Plague, and it was devastating. It wiped out a third of Europe's population. And of course, at the time, leading European scientists are working on finding a cure. But let me tell you, they failed. They never found a cure because instead, we just got lucky. Europe just ran out of rats that transferred the disease. And if it wasn't for this sheer luck, then we could possibly have all been extinct by now. Just think about that. The human species wouldn't be here today if it weren't for sheer luck. And so we just needed to get smarter, right? And we needed to build better tools to prevent something like this from happening again. Fast forward to 2019. We've gotten way better at curing disease. We have things like CAR T cell therapy, nanorobots delivering medications. We even have virtual and augmented reality creating more precise surgeries. We're way ahead of the curve when it comes to curing disease. And today, more than ever, we've built the best tools to do so. But then why is it that even though we've built the most advanced treating mechanisms, more people die due to disease? If we take a look at the data, the amount of people that have had cancer in these past two years only increases. In 2017, it was 8 million, but in 2018, it rose to 9.6 million. The amount of people that have died due to an illness in general has also risen from 21% to 31% in just under a decade. And to be clear, these numbers should not be going up. And overall, about 87% of our world's population has at least one health problem. So that's about 5 billion people right there. And so when I looked at these stats, I asked why. Why is it that we as a society have spent all of our time working on curing disease and still producing minimal results? Like what could we possibly be doing wrong? We literally have better everything, more advanced curing systems, more technology helping us out, more smart people, and more money. But still, more people continue to die. You commonly hear people, organizations, governments, and even doctors say, we want to cure cancer, we want to cure heart disease. There are literally organizations out there only working on curing certain diseases. But I still feel as though there's one question we just aren't asking. What about preventing cancer? What about preventing disease? See, we say that our health is top of our mind and that it's the most important thing. But if that were really true, then why do we treat it like an afterthought? A situation in which we wait for the problem to come to us and then try to fix everything. Because that's what we do today. We wait to get sick and then go into the doctors. We're still taking a far more reactive approach to our health. Whereas what we should be taking is a proactive approach. This just doesn't make sense. Why do I have to explain why a preventative healthcare system is better? It should just be a no-brainer. We want to prevent disease. But wait, maybe it's because we don't even think about the why first. We ask if it's even possible. Because if it was possible, then wouldn't we already be working on it? See, that's the thing. It is possible, and we need more people working on it. But I still feel as though this notion of a preventative healthcare system is just scraping the surface. Instead of just creating a preventative healthcare system, imagine we created a personalized preventative healthcare system. And what do I mean? Well, at the age of 13, which was just about a year ago, I was able to take in patient genetic data and personalize certain blood clot medications to specific patients. So if a 13-year-old can take patient genetic data, one human biomarker that makes all of us unique, and personalize certain medications to specific patients, it really shouldn't be that hard to take in a few biomarkers from a human that makes all of us unique 
and prevent disease before it occurs. And so what biomarkers am I really talking about, right? Well, that's your genetic data, your metabolomic data, and your proteomic data. So in essence, your DNA metabolites and proteins. And you can think of your genetic data like your biological code. It's this four-letter code, A, C, T, and G, that make you look the way you are and behave the way you do. Your genetics are also a combination of both of your parents' genetics, so keep this between you and me, but if they ever get mad at you for doing something, you can tell them it's their fault they gave you bad DNA. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Genetics are also what make us really unique, yet really similar. If you take a look at the person next to you, they have about 99.9% .9 the same DNA as you. So you know how your parents tell you, oh, you're special and you're unique? We're really not. We're all 99.9% .9 the same biologically. <laughs> but what about that 0.1%? Well, that's three million differences in our DNA that make all of us unique. But the sad thing about our genetics is that it's stagnant, so your DNA doesn't change throughout your entire life, whereas our metabolomics are constantly changing. Metabolomics is the study of these really, really small molecules called metabolites, which help to synthesize, bind, transfer, and build other molecules in our body. They also help to generate energy, which we need to stay alive. Like just me here walking, talking, moving, I need energy. And I wouldn't be able to generate that if it weren't for my metabolites. And so everything I've talked about so far is internal. But what about externally? How the environment interacts with our bodies? And so that's where proteomics comes in. Proteomics is the study of, of proteins, which will be able to tell us how the environment has impacted certain parts of our body. So that includes things like the food we take in, stress, the pollutants we breathe in, and so much more. And so then comes the question, how do we actually understand everything? Well, for your genetic data, we have this already existing, already FDA-approved technology called whole genome sequencing, which sequences and understands your four-letter DNA code. It takes about two weeks, and cost under $200. For metabolomics, we have an, again, already existing, already FDA-approved technology called mass spectrometry, which sends out energy to a sample and based on the energy received back, is able to tell what metabolites are where. Costs about $500 and takes about three days. And for proteomics, we have this technology called amino acid sequencing, which sequences the smaller parts of a protein it's amino acids. It takes about one week, is again, already existing, already FDA approved, and costs about $700. And so if we do all the math, the total cost to gain all the data we need to prevent disease is only $1,400. Like that is super reasonable. To break it down for you, $1,400 is only the cost of you giving up your daily morning coffee at Starbucks for a year. Like, drink Tim Hortons all you want, but no, not, <laughs> just not Starbucks. <laughs> the reason why we just haven't been thinking about this is because of our attitudes towards our health. These technologies are already existing and already FDA approved our attitudes towards our health have been so reactive. We just aren't thinking about the useful implication of technology to prevent disease. And so let's just say we have all this patient data, right? What do we do with it? Well, it'd be crazy to make a human go through it since just in your DNA, there's three million base pairs, and even if they're working 24-7, 365 days a year, it'd take them over a decade. And so something that we couldn't do 10 years ago that we can do today is take our patient data and just run it through an artificial intelligence model. What this basically does is look for specific patterns or trends and is able to spit out conclusions on what illnesses might occur in the future and how to prevent those from occurring. And how much does it cost? Zero dollars. 
It's free, simple, and easy to code. With the internet at our fingertips, we can literally do anything. And there's already so many smart people working on artificial intelligence, it really shouldn't be that hard to create a model that takes in three types of unique human biomarkers and spits out conclusions on how to prevent disease. And so now that we know th that this can be done, right? we also broke this down and we know that it can be done at a reasonably low cost. The next thing that we need to do is start to change our attitudes. Just think about a world in which patients don't get sick. Like, that's the holy grail of healthcare. If we just shift our mindsets from reactive to proactive, we can create the next revolution. And all it takes is as simple as this. Getting out of this wait for it to come to me mindset and getting into this preventative mindset our healthcare system would be way better off if we started to work on preventing disease instead of curing it. Just think about the possibilities. Not only do we save a ton of lives, we change the entire conversation around money as well. Up till 2018, the US and Europe healthcare budget was $7 trillion. Like that's crazy compared to the total revenue of Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Apple which was only one trillion. And so what can you do? Right, you can start to get your DNA metabolites and protein sequence, but I can't stress this enough, start to change your attitude. Ensure you don't get sick by checking in with your doctor more frequently. And with today's technology, your doctor can even be on your phone. And start to develop a culture. Develop a culture around proactive healthcare and preventing disease. Like, I'm going to make every single effort I can to make sure that my generation does not grow up in a society where we're still waiting for the problem to come to us. And the only people that can change that is us. See, I don't want to wake up in 20 years with the same healthcare system as today and bang my head on the wall asking why do more people die? I'm like, no, definitely not. See, what I want to do is wake up in 20 years knowing that I made an impact on today's healthcare system and that we became masters at preventing disease. That the next time you see me, I'll be on another TED stage describing something we all thought was a utopian world, a world in which patients don't get sick, but a world, that's a reality. And why? Because today, like right here, right now, was a pivotal moment when society really woke up and realized that its current healthcare system is not optimized for success. It causes more people to die, more money to be wasted, and does not work, period. And that if we take our healthcare system today and compare it to the healthcare system in the 13th century, we can see they're almost the exact same. Back then, we wait for the problem to come to us. Today, we still wait to get sick and then go into the doctors. Back then, loads of people died due to disease. Even today, with more advanced treating mechanisms, more people die due to disease. Because what we've finally started to realize is that the only way to kill mankind's biggest enemy disease is by preventing it instead of curing it. Because if we won't change our own healthcare system, Who will?